Thank you. Yes, so apologies, you've got a, a double bill from the, uh, the UK Met Office this morning. Uh, unlike David, I've not managed to update my uh, PowerPoint template to the latest corporate one, so you've got the old one. Um, I do, however, have a gratuitous picture from uh, Fermenter this morning, and if we all stay awake till the end, there are a couple more, so um, that's an incentive to uh, keep going. So, um, what I tried to do um, in the last lecture was just introduce some of the sort of kind of the theoretical benefits and uh, potential disadvantages of running coupled systems on different timescales. And then in um, this lecture, I'm going to focus more on the, the systems themselves. I did mention various systems last time, but only where I really needed to to kind of give a concrete example of some of the, the modeling points that I wanted to make. Um, so I'm going to go into more detail of the different systems. So this morning, it's going to be predominantly looking at short and medium range systems, and then um, this evening before dinner, looking at some of the slightly longer uh, timescales, which uh, I have to say is less my area of expertise, so we'll, we'll see how that goes later. Um, I, just a note at the bottom that although I'm dividing things up like this, of course, there is the potential for a for a single system to produce products over a range of timescales. So uh, you run something for short range, and some of those members maybe you run on for your seasonal forecast, for example. So uh, they don't necessarily divide up quite as cleanly as that. But th that's roughly the structure I'm going to take this morning. So uh, short and medium range. Um, this is really systems uh, with the aim to be used for both ocean forecasting and numerical weather prediction, or NWP. Now, I guess to some extent it's still an open question, going back to some of the things we were talking about earlier in the week, whether you can really build a system that, that does both those things well, or whether you have to make too many compromises. Uh, but that's, that's kind of roughly where we're looking. Uh, time scale. Um, Timescales are always quite difficult to define. Different people have different definitions of different uh, sort of ranges of prediction. I'm sort of working on this sort of one to two weeks for this short, medium range uh, timescale. And if you are intending to use this system for numerical weather prediction, you obviously need quite a high resolution atmosphere, ideally. So um, probably at least 25 kilometers. Most of the operational numerical weather prediction systems are now getting towards 10 kilometers. So um, that, that's kind of a minimum, probably. Um, and in the ocean, um, at least a quarter of a degree, um, but obviously we've seen a lot this week about going to 12 a degree for sort of state-of-the-art systems. Uh, some systems have, have a wave model, and there was a question about that at the end yesterday, and I think that that's an important thing to include, although uh, it's perhaps been less high priority in developments in some centers. Uh, obviously, on these timescales, I, I think you'll all realize by now that the initial conditions for all the components are very important to be able to make short-range predictions. Uh, I talked uh, earlier in the week about the consistency of those initial conditions to avoid initialization shocks, and I'll come back to that again as well. Uh, so some systems are using coupled data simulation, although as we'll see, actually not very many at the moment in a, in a kind of operational sort of system. Um, and actually, most systems are only kind of borderline operational sort of demonstration systems or sort of research systems running in real time. But over the next um, kind of year or so, I think uh, that will change a fair bit. So as I said, the last lecture was kind of more about some of the sort of theoretical benefits and problems of coupling. Uh, here, I'm going to go through some examples of specific uh, systems. Uh, which are either operational or very close to operational, uh, or, or as I say, maybe research running in, in real-time mode. Um, the four I'm going to just mention are these here. So in the Environment Canada system, uh, work that's being done towards the kind of unified US National Earth System prediction capability, uh, ECMWF, and then the UK Met Office. Uh, those four, I think, probably are, are the sort of four leading uh, proponents of these coupled systems. Uh, there may well be others I've missed, but um, those are certainly the ones that I had easy access to uh, information and, and slides about. So that's, those are the ones I'm going to focus on, and they probably illustrate most of what I would want to say anyway. So just to start with, and I'll keep coming back to this table, I've, I'm, I've kind of summarized the systems I think we're looking at as we, as we work through. Um, so there's a few sort of shorthands in this table. So um, 
This is the Environment Canada prediction system on the top, so 25 kilometer atmosphere, quarter of degree ocean. Um, the UC here I've put uh, to indicate it's got uncoupled data assimilation. Um, and then again, when I've got uh, WC, that's for weekly coupled data assimilation uh, using the kind of um, conventions that uh, Ibrahim mentioned uh, yesterday. Um, then the, the, the US ESP. PC system being developed for 2018, again uncoupled data simulation but very high resolution. Uh, ECMWF again uncoupled data simulation, um, looking like going operational early 2018 but with some, something called partial coupling which I'll, I'll come back to. Uh, and then sort of two systems at the UK Met Office, one which as I say does have weekly coupled data simulation. It's relatively low resolution for the atmosphere, at least. And that's the system that we provide to the Copernicus Marine Service. Uh, and you've perhaps already heard about and will hear about in, in Marie's talk. Um, and then finally, a sort of research system that's being run in real time, which has got uncoupled data assimilation, um, but it's got a, an atmosphere which matches our operational numerical weather prediction resolution. So I'll, I'll go through all of those. So starting with the Environment Canada system. So I've got a few slides. Um, these are mainly from about a year ago. So hopefully they're not, not too out of date. So this is their, um, what they sometimes call their concepts system. So their uh, global uh, ocean sea ice atmosphere coupled uh, system. And um, it's been running operationally. So it was probably, probably I think, the first sort of operational coupled NWP uh, system with a high resolution atmosphere. So as I say, it's got a 25 kilometer atmosphere. It's using one of these sort of fancy yin yang grids in the atmosphere. Uh, the ocean is more perhaps familiar to us. It's just using a, a NEMO quarter of a degree or 025 uh, configuration. And they're running 10 day forecasts uh, actually twice a day uh, and making that data available. So the ocean, it's a NEMO ocean model. Uh, and as at the Met Office, they couple that to the SICE, uh, Los Alamos sea ice model. Um, and this is um, a similar example to some of the things that uh, I showed uh, uh, on uh, whatever day it was, Monday. Um, so looking at uh, impacts they've seen in the coupling of that system. So the sort of the theoretical impacts you expect, sort of seeing a cold wake, uh, when a tropical cyclone passes through, they see that and actually see quite significant differences in sea surface temperature compared to uh, what they would have had for their atmosphere models seeing a sea surface temperature analysis. And uh, as is the kind of uh, conventional wisdom, that then generally redu reduces the minimum uh, central pressure in your uh, tropical storm, um, which for most systems has started to become a good thing. So when you go to a sort of 10 kilometer atmosphere, they tend to over deepen storms on average. So um, feedbacks like this cooling of the SST, which tend to uh, reduce that deepening, generally speaking, bring um, the pressure back closer to what the verifying analysis, which is what that black line uh, suggests it should be. And, and this uh, plot on the bottom right is just showing the, 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 the really big difference that the latent heat flux is making uh, between uh, this sea surface temperature and this sea surface temperature. So having a massive difference on the, on the, on the heat being uh, passed into the, into the atmosphere. Um, and this is another way of looking at some of their, their results from, from tropical storms and looking at the false alarm rate. Uh, and again, in all uh, basins, they see the difference between the blue line, the uncoupled atmosphere system, and the red line, the coupled atmosphere system, seeing a significant reduction in, in false alarm rate. Uh, which they say is statistically significant from about day three onwards. So uh, kind of positive results and consistent with what's been seen in, in other systems. Um, they've also looked at things like um, the geopotential heights. So uh, this is geopotential heights at five days into the forecast in the atmosphere. And anywhere where these plots are red uh, is showing an improvement with the coupled system as opposed to the uncoupled system. And again, these, these are being driven by changes in the heat and moisture uh, exchange at the surface of them being pumped up into the atmosphere and affecting the, uh, the density of, of the atmosphere above. So uh, generally positive signals, particularly uh, quite near the surface and also quite high up. And actually what they find is they uh, run 
further into the forecast, some of these kind of intermediate uh, heights also see an improvement as well. Um, and these changes are being driven by, by kind of events uh, like in that region over there where you've got significant differences um, which are pumping up into the atmosphere. Um, and then this is uh, showing a sort of lead time plot of the different uh, geopotential height improvements in different regions, so the northern extropics uh, and in an Asian region. And again, you see uh, the red line is always outperforming uh, the blue line. A, a slight caveat, these are compared against uh, era interim, which I guess is, is quite old now. Um, but um, all the signs are that this is an improvement compared to the uncoupled system. So moving on to, uh, to the work in, in the US, and as far as I know, this is still planned for a sort of first operational implementation in 2018. So uh, these slides are just um, kind of indicating where uh, some of the US systems uh, are going with this ESPC. And in fact, we've talked about coupled ocean atmosphere systems. Actually, the, the goal sort of moving from where they were back in 2002 back to sort of towards 2020 is actually have a coupled space atmosphere, ocean, land, wave, ice system. So um, quite, a, quite a complex system with all components included. And they're sort of moving towards that. Uh, in, a, in a sort of uh, stepwise sense, they're not trying to do everything at once. But the aim for 2018, um, as I understand it, is to, to have a very high resolution uh, ocean model for the deterministic forecast model, so a 25th of the degree high com. Um, the atmosphere model, on there it says 19 kilometers, on another slide it says 13 kilometers, so I'm not quite sure which one of those is right, but certainly uh, getting up towards the sort of uh, 10 kilometer that other systems are using. Uh, and then the ensemble that goes alongside that has also got pretty high resolution atmosphere by, by a lot of uh, ocean, by a lot of people's standards, so that's still a 12th degree uh, ocean going with that. Um, and some, some early results from from this global coupled system. Again, this is from about a year ago, so I guess they've got uh, more results uh, now. Um, but generally performing uh, quite well. This is a plot of the SSH uh, variability uh, comparing um, the GOFS uh, system, which is replacing GOFS 3.1. Uh, you see significant more SSH variability, which um, I think it's largely attributed in this case to, to having the, the surface pressure forcing included uh, as part of the coupling, which it wasn't previously. And most aspects of the ocean, looking at sort of temperature profiles, mean RMS biases, et cetera, um, between the red lines and the black lines, the old system and, and the new one, I mean, in most cases, you'd be hard pressed to kind of see much significant difference. Um, but I guess as a first sort of prototype system, that, that's kind of what they're aiming for, to get something which is fairly comparable to the, to the old system. Uh, I'll move now on to, to ECMWF. Um, so I've got a few slides from, from what they're doing. Uh, they've got a, a very high resolution atmosphere, uh, nine kilometers. Uh, but the ocean is still relatively low. Uh, in some people's eyes, a quarter of a degree. And in fact, they've only relatively recently moved to a quarter of a degree from, from one degree, which they were using for a lot of their systems for a long time. As I say, they're using uncoupled data assimilation at the moment. Uh, so these are some slides uh, from, from Patrick at ECMWF um, towards the end of last year. Um, so as I say, it's uncoupled data assimilation. Uh, so the atmospheric and ocean analyses are computed separately. And then they run a couple forecasts. And they have the, the WAM wave model uh, in their system as well. So they have the ECMWF IFS atmosphere, NEMO ocean model, and now coupled to the LIM sea ice model. And again, they weren't using a sea ice model until, until relatively recently. So along with the, the resolution upgrade of the ocean, that's been a, a, a new a feature of their system. Uh, and uh, the sort of coupling exchanges are, are indicated on, on that slide as well. Um, and I mentioned this partial coupling. So um, the concerns that, that they've had with the adjustment of SST uh, between the analysis uh, and the forecast, um, they've, they've addressed by using, I guess, what some people might view as a bit of a sort of engineering approach, which is 
Uh, at the beginning of the forecast, the atmosphere still sees the OSTE as sea surface temperature. So that's the sea surface temperature analysis that's used during the atmospheric uh, analysis cycle and data assimilation. So that's what the atmosphere is familiar with. And there's no sudden jump uh, in what the atmosphere sees during the beginning of the forecast. It sees a persisted OSTEA sea surface temperature during the forecast. And then on top of that, they apply the tendencies in the ocean model. So they, uh, if the SSTs are changing in the ocean model, then they, they, that, that delta is applied on top of the OSTEA SST during the first four days. And then gradually, um, that's shifted towards a point in day eight when the atmosphere model is just seeing the, the ocean SSTs and, and has none of the, the OSTEA SST left in it. Um, and so the, the sort of rationale behind that, as I say, is it avoids initialization shock. You can kind of assume that the, the eddies are, and fronts are better resolved and better positioned in, in, in OSTEA at the start than they are in the ocean analysis that you're using to initialize the system. We've seen that a quarter of a degree doesn't necessarily look great, for example, particularly in the North Atlantic. So you kind of retain this information for as long as possible. Um, but at some point, you want to be taking account of, for example, seasonal cycles or changes in the eddy position. So at some point, uh, and they've chosen kind of day four to gradually transition to, uh, to using the NEMO SST. Um, and actually, that's what they were doing globally in their ensemble and have been doing for, for a while. I can't quite remember when they started doing that. Um, but they've now been experimenting in their high-resolution deterministic system where they do this partial coupling, um, except in the tropics, where they do full coupling right from the beginning. I'm not quite sure what, what latitude they kind of transition between the two, and presumably there's a kind of gentle kind of ramping between the two system, between the two sort of coupling approaches. Uh, and I'm not 100% sure how currents are dealt with. I assume currents are fully coupled uh, from the start, but I, I, I don't have the information on that. Um, so they're looking, in when they do their upgrade at ECMWF uh, in early 2018, to, to put this um, full coupling in the tropics and partial coupling in the higher latitudes into their operational deterministic system. Um, these are some results, uh, relatively recent results, from those tests they've been doing, uh, comparing a coupled high resolution with their deterministic high resolution model, the operational system, uh, running for, I think, all of, it's quite a long period, I think it's a year's worth of data. And, and kind of unsurprisingly, you see most of the differences are in the tropics because that's where they're doing this full coupling and outside they're doing the partial coupling. But anywhere it, where it's blue, you're seeing a reduction in the, uh, the normalized RMS error compared to the, um, the high resolution system. So you've got the surface pressure on the left, uh, 500 hectopascal height on the right, and then these are uh, winds and relative humidity, showing that you get uh, reductions, smaller reductions. So these are only kind of a couple of percent at uh, day, I think these are at, does it say somewhere? I think they're at day five or something. Um, but um, yeah, these are only a couple of percent, whereas these are kind of more like 10% differences in places. Uh, but the differences in winds and relative humidities are, are kind of right up through the atmosphere from the surface up to sort of 100 hectopascal height. So um, they've been kind of quite pleased with the, the improvements they've seen from the coupling, and that's what's driving the, uh, the decision to go towards um, uh, coupling in the deterministic system, uh, at least in the tropics. Uh, so I'll now talk a little bit about some of the, the Met Office results. So this is the only system of the ones that I'm talking about today where we're using uh, some form of weekly coupled data simulation. I know some people would argue it, it, it's hardly coupled at all, but it's, it's this approach of using the couple model to provide the background um, and then doing the simulation separately in the two systems uh, and then running the, the coupled forecast. So there is a way for information to be passed between the two systems, but not directly in the way that Ibrahim was talking about uh, yesterday or the day before. So we're running uh, a 40 kilometer atmosphere. So kind of not yet a resolution that you'd really want to use for numerical weather prediction. We're coupling that hourly to um, an ocean component, which uh, is very similar to the Canadian one, so a NEMO size component, a quarter of a degree. Um, 
unlike some centers, we use uh, 75 vertical levels. So that's the one that gives you the one meter surface resolution David was just mentioning at the end of his talk. Um, and so we run these analysis cycles. And I showed a sort of schematic of the operational system in my previous talk. So we run a six hour analysis cycles to match the atmosphere analysis window. Um, so that's what's indicated here. And then we initialize the 10 day forecast, which is using exactly the same system as far as the science is concerned. So we have no uh, initialization adjustments between those two systems. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, just trying to indicate the, the difference between uncoupled, what we call uncoupled data simulation, where you use the separate uh, model backgrounds, then do the data simulation, then run your, uh, initialize your coupled forecast, as opposed to using a coupled model to provide the background, then run the separate DA, and then run the coupled forecast. And when we were first testing this coupled data simulation approach, uh, so a slightly earlier system than the one I've just um, shown the details of, um, we found, in general, the, there was a reduction in the sea surface temperature increments in our coupled system. So wherever it's blue, um, it's, it's not particularly clear from this plot, but there's, there's more blue than red. Um, so generally, there's a bit of a reduction, particularly in the, in the tropics of sea surface temperature increments, suggesting that the system's better in balance and the, the data simulations having to work less hard to, to, to bring things back to where it thinks they should be. Um, and then this is an example, again, showing the difference between uh, running with uncoupled data simulation and a weekly coupled data simulation. So these two systems are uh, exactly the same in the forecast. Uh, so uh, the same science uh, and everything else comparable in the forecast. But in the analysis, um, we've got uh, the, the red dots correspond to weekly coupled data simulation and the blue to um, to uncoupled data simulation, which for the analysis is just ocean only. So you see that we're um, improving RMS errors um, and mean biases against the, uh, the ocean only system in the analysis, and that persists uh, during the forecast as well. I should just say these are what we sort of talk about as being sort of class four type uh, plots, and Fabrice is going to uh, mention those, I guess, in some of what he says later. So. Um, it's a methodology for comparing against observations at, at the exact points that they were in the model. And again, a, a sort of spatial picture of what's going on there. We saw it, see the difference between uncoupled data simulation and weak coupled data simulation for the SSTs in the analysis. Um, and using OSTEA sea surface temperature analysis as a verifying uh, kind of truth, which uh, maybe you need to be cautious about. I think Ostia may be a bit cold in places, uh, but certainly the new system is, is, is closer uh, to Ostia in, in, in most regions. Uh, so we're, we're pretty pleased with that result. And actually, um, this is, a, again, a sort of time series of, of those class 4 sea surface temperature metrics for the analysis. Uh, ignore the blue line for the moment, but it's showing the, the ocean-only analysis the, in green. The, so that's, if you like, the uncoupled data simulation analysis, the weekly coupled data simulation in red, uh, and the austere uh, sea surface temperature analysis um, in a kind of grey colour. So actually, you see on, on these kind of metrics, the coupled data simulation um, system is, is beating the, the austere analysis as far as root mean square error. Of course, austere is higher resolution. It's got a lot more detail in. These are quite sort of crude metrics, if you like, but at least in this sense, the system looks like it's, it's, it's performing well, and it's certainly outperforming the ocean-only analysis system. Uh, so that's in the ocean, kind of moving to the impact in the atmosphere. Um, as I say, the atmosphere isn't really high enough resolution to, to say much about what's going on and how well it's performing. Um, but it, but you know, obviously that doesn't stop you looking at things and just using our kind of what we call at the Met Office our numerical weather prediction index, which is kind of what gets used to to determine a lot of our upgrades. You know, if, if that if that number's not positive in an upgrade, we, we're not going to implement something regardless of how good it looks in in other aspects. So this was comparing our weekly coupled data simulation system running for, in this case, six months with our um, 
operational NWP system at the time. Um, so it's a slightly unfair comparison because our, this was for 2015 when our operational system didn't have some of the science improvements that we were able to put in our weekly coupled system. But at the same time, the operational system had all the benefit of much higher resolution and uh, coupled ensemble hybrid data simulation. So um, you would expect the, the operational system to be doing pretty well. And actually, it's quite nice to see that at least going back to 2015, our system with a 40 kilometer atmosphere would, would, would actually outperform what we were running operationally at the time, which probably makes it one of the sort of top handful of systems in the world from a sort of NWP verification perspective. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk a bit about another Met Office system which we've um, had running in real time uh, as a research system for a few months now. Um, so this is using uncoupled data simulation. It's much more like some of those early results I was showing from, from that previous system. Um, but the advantage is it has a 10 kilometer atmosphere. So it now matches exactly what we're running operationally um, at the Met Office at the moment. So we can, we can make those kind of uh, more direct comparisons. So I'm going to show a few results from, from this system. Actually, they're not all from the, the real-time system with that 10 kilometer atmosphere. Some of them are from, a, from a versions with lower resolution atmosphere, but they're all uncoupled uh, data simulation. And again, focusing on the atmosphere. So this was a, a kind of expanded version of that NWP index information I, I showed you, a sort of global scorecard showing how the system uh, is performing uh, and anything green is, is good. The bigger the boxes, um, the better. And uh, if you can just about make out these kind of uh, gray boxes there, um, I think 3% uh, differences in, in RMS errors. Uh, and there's comparisons both against observations against and against EC analyses, which we often use for for verifying as well. So uh, this, in this case, it was a relatively small number of cases, slightly lower resolution atmosphere, so more like 17 kilometers rather than 10 kilometers, but comparing to a, a direct equivalent atmosphere system. And you see that in general, there's more, there's more green than red, and particularly, um, if you could see the detail, particularly in, in, in the tropical areas, you see significant uh, improvements. Um, and these are not dissimilar sort of um, plots to some of the ones I showed for the Canadian system, showing kind of modest but uh, kind of consistent improvements in, in some aspects, for example, of mean sea level pressure um, over a whole range of cases, in this case, uh, in the tropical Indian Ocean and in a slightly uh, wider tropical uh, regime. But that is a much lower resolution case in that, in that example. Um, and as with all systems, we looked at tropical cyclones, and we've actually been able to look at a whole range of, of different systems, so either coupled or uncoupled. So we've looked at the 10 kilometer system. So this is our operational system, the N1280 uncoupled system. This is a, a coupled version of it. Uh, and then this is our previous operational system, about 17 kilometers with a coupled version of it, and then a slightly lower resolution uh, coupled version as well. And these are showing uh, mean sea level pressure errors uh, in tropical cyclones. Um, I forget exactly how many cases there are, but it was it was a fair number of cases went into these uh, these statistics, and um, and actually you see that the impact of coupling is probably larger in many cases than the impact of, of resolution as we, as we look at these different lines, and in particular you see this 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 sort of trend that we've seen before that current operational NWP systems at sort of 10 kilometer resolution tend to over deepen storms. And actually, the coupling seems to kind of bring it back to closer to what it, it should be. Now, of course, there's then the sort of question what happens when NWP systems go even higher resolution. Um, but there's still quite a lot to, to understand, I think, about whether the vertical mixing in the ocean is responding correctly to the wind stress changes in the, in the tropical cyclone, for example. So I think there's, there's quite a lot more than, than maybe a plot like that would, would suggest. But, but on the face of it, um, it's demonstrating that those cooler SSTs are having the impact we've seen, for example, in the Canadian system as well, uh, of um, preventing over-deepening of, of the cyclones. Um, 
And the track errors actually changed by, by more than we expected as well. So beyond about t plus 60, we got significant decreases in the track errors. Uh, so these, these, both the blue and the green lines are showing reductions in track errors from the coupled system, with the blue being all the storms and the green being just storms with forecast winds over 75 knots. Um, and you see, particularly for those strong storms, uh, there's pretty large, significantly different uh, track errors, so up to sort of 100 kilometer difference by the end of the forecast. The number of storms in this sample is relatively small, so um, that I, th I think there's an updated version of this plot which maybe shows a slightly smaller uh, improvement, but still there's certainly um, a good improvement in track errors coming from coupling in that case. Uh, so, sort of just wrapping up now, uh, these are the, uh, the systems that, again, sort of summarized to, to remind you of where we are and to sort of, I think, remind you of the sort of key points on, on where we are with both coupled data simulation. So, basically, very few systems are using any kind of coupled data simulation in these operational systems yet. Um, you know, plans for, for things later but not necessarily now. And very few systems are using anything above quarter of a degree uh, ocean. Uh, so those are the, um, the sort of summary points I've got here as well. Um, and I think the reasons for those things are, are probably kind of various and partly historical. Um, but as I say, most systems are not even using any weekly coupled data simulation. Obviously, that's kind of quite a complicated thing to do, even, it, even in its weakest form, dealing with the kind of challenges of, of ocean observation latency and things like that that I talked about before. And actually, I think partly it's because alternative approaches to, to dealing with initialization shocks, like that partial coupling approach, which I guess isn't to everyone's taste, but, but, but seems to be doing a good job for, for ECMWF. Uh, the way the Canadian system is, is dealing with it is really trying to be as careful as possible to make sure there's not a jump in the sea surface temperatures. So the Ostia sea surface temperature analysis that the atmosphere analysis system sees is, is the same one as is assimilated into their ocean analysis. So they kind of try their best to keep things consistent and they do some careful sort of um, work around sea ice edges as well to make sure that um, things stay consistent. So with a bit of work, uh, and a bit of kind of engineering, you can deal with this without going to weekly coupled data simulation or, or, or a more strongly coupled data simulation. Obviously, you don't get any potential benefits of, of the observations impacting the different systems, but you avoid the potential downfalls. Um, as I say, most systems still using quarter of degree ocean. I think that's partly due to cost, um, but actually, it's probably worth noting that those centers that I've talked about it are not running ocean-only eddy resolving systems either. So the Met Office doesn't have a 12-degree ocean-only system, um, neither do ECMWF or the Canadians, for example. And um, I think I think I'd probably slightly kind of uh, disagree with, with with Eric's comment earlier in the week that that 12 degree is is the norm for sort of good day class ocean forecasting systems. It's certainly where we'd all like to be, um, but probably the majority of systems around the world are still running a quarter of a degree and kind of looking towards 12 a degree in, in a year or two's time. Uh, and when that happens, I think those will then feed into the coupled systems as well. So as I say, next steps, probably a higher resolution ocean. Um, more strongly coupled data simulation, whether that's going from no coupled data simulation to weakly coupled or, or going a bit beyond that, for example, in the Met Office system. Um, I think the benefits of that are still to be demonstrated. Um, perhaps one of the more immediate focuses will be looking at, uh, at using ensembles um, with various forms of hybrid data simulation for both the atmosphere and the ocean. So if you're running a coupled ensemble, um, making use of that to, uh, to for your deterministic atmosphere and ocean components within the coupled system and trying to do that in a consistent way so that your ensemble isn't kind of centered around a different uh, kind of deterministic state than, uh, than, than it ought to be because of the impact of the coupling, for example. So that's, I think, where I was going to 
leave it. Um, so a couple more pictures just to uh, eat. So that was this morning. It was very nice. Thank you.